Uh, my name is Jay Shamba. I'm the co-director of the Institute for International Economic Policy, or IIEP, uh, here at George Washington University. Um, we here at IAP are very pleased to be hosting this event on China's outward investments, state capitalism, or capital flight as part of our series on China's economy and the U.S.-China economic relations. And to once again be partnering with our co-sponsor, the Seeker Center for Asian Studies at George Washington University. IAP is located at the Elliott School at GW and is a cross-disciplinary, cross-school research center at GW. Uh, IAP St aims to serve uh, as a catalyst for high quality, multidisciplinary, nonpartisan research on policy issues surrounding a range of issues of economic globalization. We interpret it, that mandate pretty broadly um, and support research and policy work on areas ranging from trade to international finance to development economics to poverty studies, climate change and economic policy more broadly. And we have also focused on policy issues around China's economy and India's economy as of late. And the focus on China's economy is a longstanding one for us at IAP and is one of what we call our signature initiatives. Uh, we've been pretty busy uh, at IAP lately. Uh, next week alone, we'll have a Monday morning seminar on multidimensional poverty, co-sponsor a Tuesday morning session on Africa's uh, Africa after COVID-19, charting a new course for economic growth, and a Friday morning conversation on India's federal finances in COVID times, including N.K. Singh, who chaired the 15th Finance Commission for India. Um, so if you'd like to know any more about any of those events or further events in our series on China, please go to the events section of our webpage. Um, at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Maggie Chen, who, uh, in addition to being a former director of IAP herself, has taken the lead on organizing our year-long virtual China conference uh, this year. Uh, Maggie, please take it away. Thanks, Jay. <clears throat> good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Um, so over the course of the last 13 years, IAEP has built a leading forum for addressing issues critical to US-China economic relations. The annual conference has featured over 120 leading scholars and practitioners and over 50 panels that attracted more than 2,000 participants from around the world. Here, I would like to give a particular shout out to our friends, our co-sponsors and our alumni, in particular Ning Li and Dan Stramilo, for their invaluable support, which have been instrumental to the success of the conference. This year, we kicked off our series with a keynote speech by Professor Carmen Reinhardt, the Chief Economist of the World Bank and Professor of Harvard Kennedy School. We then held three additional events featuring academic and industry leaders from Hong Kong, Singapore, and Washington, discussing US-China trade issues, political relations, and the pandemic recession. Today, we will switch gears to highlight another prominent topic area, China's outward investments. We're very delighted to welcome three distinguished experts, all of whom have worked extensively in the field, including our speaker today, Professor Meg Liesmeyer from Harvard Business School, who will share her new research assessing China's outward investments and the changing role of the state. And our two discussants, Professor Deborah Prodigan, Director of the China Africa Research Initiative at SAIS Johns Hopkins University, and Professor Stephen Kaplan, my colleague and Professor of Political Science and International Affairs at GW. Stephen will introduce our guest today, but first I would like to offer congratulations to him for his new book, as an expert on the political economy of global finance and development, in particular China's foreign investment in developing countries. Stephen's new book, Globalizing Patient Capital, The Political Economy of Chinese Finance in the Americas, will be published by Cambridge University Press this spring. In fact, we're going to have a book launch event um, at the end of um, the spring, April, around April. So uh, be on the lookout for that. The book examines China's overseas financial investments in the developing world and the role of China's state-led capitalism in national level governance across the Americas. I look forward to learning from all of our panelists today and the intersections of their research. So let me turn it over to Stephen now, who will introduce our guest today. Thank you very much, Maggie. Uh, it's my pleasure uh, to present uh, both Meg Rithmeyer uh, as well as Deborah Brodigam. 
uh, two scholars have, that have really, through their nuanced understanding of Chinese uh, economics and investment, really push the boundaries of our understanding of uh, what China is trying to accomplish with its outward investment uh, and financial, economic, and trade ties uh, internationally. Uh, first, our presenter today, Meg Rithmeyer, is an associate professor at Harvard Business School, uh, where she teaches in the Business, Government, and International Economy Unit. Uh, she's also faculty affiliate at the Fairbanks, Fairbanks Center for Chinese Studies, where she convenes a seminar on the Chinese economy as well. Um, she is a political scientist with a PhD in government from Harvard University, and her primary expertise is in the comparative politics and political economy of China and Southeast Asia. Um, her first book, Land Bargains and Chinese Capitalism by Cambridge University Press came out in 2015 and examines the role of land uh, politics, urban governments, and local property rights regimes in China's economic reforms. She's also currently working on a new pro book project tentatively titled Unfaithful Friends, Business and Political Elites in Authoritarian Asia. Um, you can also uh, check out uh, Professor Rithmeyer's recent work in comparative politics, uh, which will be coming out this next year as well, and reflects uh, some of the themes uh, that we'll be talking about today. I also have the pleasure of presenting Deborah Brodigam today, who is the director of the China Africa Research Initiative uh, and professor of international political economy uh, over at SAIS, uh, just across the way in town here. Um, she is a leading expert on China and Africa. Uh, some of her books uh, include uh, Will Africa Feed China by Oxford University Press in 2015 and The Dragon's Gift, The Real Story of China in Africa. And finally, China Aid in African Development, Exporting Green Revolution. So if you're looking to better understand the relationship of China in Africa, turn to the work of Deborah Brodigan. Uh, so without any further ado, uh, I turn it uh, back over to our uh, I guess main presenters uh, today. Great. So thank you so much. Um, it's a real privilege to be here. Um, and especially, you know, with people like Maggie Chen and Jay Shamba and um, Stephen Kaplan and Deborah Brodigam, whose work I've admired for so long. And I feel like um, I've chosen the right presentation to talk mostly about China and Southeast Asia because I wouldn't begin to try to tell these people about China in the Americas or in Africa. And so hopefully um, we can we can compare those regions perhaps a little bit in the Q&A. Um, so, um, so thanks for having me, and thanks again to the um, to the the group at, at GW for especially the um, logistics. It was very smooth, and I, I'm grateful to the staff for getting me all connected. Um, so the title is slightly different. I apologize than what I said earlier, but um, I assure you the message will be the same: the logics and limit the logic and limits of China's outward investment. Um, and part of the material for this presentation comes from a paper that's forthcoming at Comparative Politics. Um, you can find that on my website. And another working paper that I have co-authored with Margaret Pearson of University of Maryland and Kelly Tsai of Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, looking at China's party state capitalism in general and what it means um, for its, its, its role in the global economy. Um, so, you know, I don't need to present this audience with any of the uh, amazing details of China's rapid transition from capital importer to capital exporter that happened really in the last 15 years. Um, we've seen, uh, you know, a 60 fold increase in China's outward foreign direct investment and a plethora of um, reasoning about that, you know, is China buying the world, the specter of global China, many people here have written books about China's um, outward financial investments and, um, and what it means basically for the world. It presents at least two theoretical puzzles, um, at least I say, because likely many, many more than that, China's emergence on the world stage as a global financer and a global investor. Um, one, to international political economy, and a second, to comparative politics. Um, so first, the international political economy puzzle is that we have under theorized the role of home country policy, particularly in authoritarian regimes. And part of that is sensible. The vast majority of countries that have been sending capital, with the, with the um, uh, um, exception of perhaps the Gulf states, um, in the last half century or so have been democracies, advanced, <clears throat> advanced developed democracies. And China presents a puzzle in that way. 
And the way we tend to think about that is that, you know, China is pushing things abroad because China's authoritarian regime has some strategy in the world. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but we have an empirical puzzle even within that conception, which is that actually China's outward policy, um, policy toward outward direct investment appears to be rather ambivalent or vacillating. So on the one hand, we have Xi Jinping in 2013, you know, saying push investment outwards with the Belt and Road, which is a continuation perhaps of a policy from the 1990s of pushing China's companies, specifically SOEs out in the world. But then we get also in the last five or six years, the picture that perhaps not all is going <laughs> going quite as according to plan with that. So we have capital controls that are erected in 2016, 2017. We have you know moments of contention between the state and its largest international investors. You see here on the left, um, Beijing basically nationalized Anbang Insurance, a company that had extensive outward investment, and we get the recalibration of the BRI. So the sense that um, policy is not kind of uniformly moving um, in, in the direction of increasing liberalization, but has its own fits and starts. And so making sense of that is one puzzle. And the second puzzle, which I'll argue is related, or at least the answer to it is related to the first, is the sort of issue of authoritarian state business relations in the context of globalization. So while an early generation of work of research on comparative politics and the role of business, um, especially in, in democracy and authoritarianism, this is the kind of classic conceptualization from the early 20th century, business was given this role of democratizer. Um, but in the last half century or so, you find comparative politics literature and scholarship that's much more focused on the role that capitalists play in, in, in kind of buttressing authoritarian regimes, so friends to the, um, to the authoritarian class. But the context of globalization introduces a new element to this, right? When domestic business classes have exit options, being able to invest abroad, how does that affect the balance of power between the state and business? And it's a particularly interesting empirical puzzle in China. So given all of the work that we have on is China buying the world, CCP Inc., I'll, I'll show you some of those things in a minute. One interesting fact is that in the last, so we have this idea that Chinese outward foreign direct investment does not fit the mold of what happened before, um, that it's all driven by state-owned companies that prefer institutionally weak environments and countries with resources that can be extracted. But if you look actually from 2013 to 2018, which is the period I'll mostly be speaking about today, a lot of Chinese investments did not go to such countries, right? China's outward foreign direct investment went to Europe and the United States, places in developed countries with secure institutions that didn't have resources that China was necessarily extracting. So I'd argue that in these empirical patterns of the state's kind of policy ambivalence or apparent policy ambivalence and these new empirical patterns that emerged after 2013 are quite related. So here you have some common conceptions of China in the world, China Inc., CCP Inc., party state capitalism, debt trap diplomacy. Um, one of those terms is mine, so I don't disagree with all of them. Um, I certainly disagree with debt trap diplomacy as an idea. But what they all have in common is that China is sort of a challenge to the global liberal order in certain ways. And many of these conceptions sort of put China in this um, realm of it's a coordinated strategic effort. And so what we get kind of is this idea that whatever Beijing is doing is planned in advance. It's highly strategic. It's all consistent with Beijing's interests. We should see certainly SOEs, if not all Chinese companies, as extensions of the Chinese party state, and that it's politically sophisticated with China's international security as the bottom line. As you can tell, I do not think that this is a correct description of what China is doing. Instead, I would argue that we should see China's internationalization much in the same way we saw its domestic reforms. So it's experimental, it's happening in fits and starts, it's driven by campaigns rather than strategic plans, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that distinction. Um, for firms, it is frequently commercial in motive for firms of all kinds, including state-owned enterprises and non-state firms, and that the state is responsive to domestic security concerns just as it, as it is responsive to international security concerns. I wouldn't agree, I, I would not disagree rather, that it's not that it that it is, you know, inconsistent with some global liberal order, whatever that is, and whoever ruined it is a, a subject of a different talk that I'm sure um, would be interesting. Um, but the, the argument that I would like to make is that the party state approaches its internationalization with discretion, its own discretion over its own domestic actors and actors within the state as its own bottom line which indeed means it's unwilling to commit to rules um, about how internationalization and international finance should proceed, um, but not necessarily because it has a strategic and highly coordinated plan, but precisely because it doesn't. <laughs> 
All right. Um, so the argument that I'll make regarding how we explain these puzzles is that there are different logics of, of capital of accumulation are explaining outward investment. And so we see this puzzle in China about the fits and starts and about how different firms are behaving differently. So I would argue um, that the, the, the thing that China's internationalization introduces to the study of outward investment and internationalization in this way is that we have to think about domestic political status and domestic political vulnerability. As, an, as a part of our explanation for how different types of capital behave. And that the Chinese street, state treats these different forms of capital differently. And that makes sense of its approach to managing outward direct investment. And I would characterize that approach as a set of campaigns, campaigns being something familiar in Chinese politics that are adjusted over time, combined with domestic regulation. So there's this wonderful book by Rosalind Xu at, at Temple University where she talks about the, the globalization two-step, where China, when it opened um, to inward direct investment and inward um, trade competition, it sort of did this liberalization and then a domestic re-regulation to maintain some protectionist measures. And I, I'm saying that we can think of its internationalization in sort of similar terms. So a sort of push outward and then a second step re-regulation to tweak um, the apparent consequences of that outward investment. So I'll talk that I'll talk about that today with regard to China's general outward direct investment and then specifically the Belt and Road. Um, and so then the and then the last kind of part of the argument is there are limits to this. There are limits then to what it means for what the party state's able to accomplish. And three specific limits, which I list here, but we'll talk about um, in more detail as I go through the talk, um, meaning both its experimental approach, the political risks that are generated by both things, both in terms of political risk to its domestic security and the backlash that's generated um, in host countries or trade partners. So What's interesting about China's internationalization in the last 10 years is that it presents, as I said, this challenge to dominant theories in international political economy and dominant theories in Chinese domestic political economy that we've been, um, certain approaches we've been using for the last at least, uh, at least 30 or 40 years. So in, in international political economy, as you see the statement here by David Lake, the dominant paradigm is this open economy politics. And the core assumption of that is as you read, the relevant political actors and their interests are defined by their production profile or position in the international economy. And I would say one thing that China's entry requires us to revise is that domestic political status right within an authoritarian regime can be just as important if not frequently way more important than the production profile or position in the international economy my sense is that's probably what stephen means by patient capital in many ways um, and so we can talk about that um, but certainly that political status needs to be understood just as much as their economic interests however those are devised the second challenge is that for the last 30 years or so Students of China's politics and political economy have drawn this bright line between the state and the private sector. Um, so the state being, you know, companies that are majority owned by the Chinese state, whether at the central level or at the local level, and private economy being those commercially oriented actors who are not interfered with um, from the party state itself. But increasingly, we know that these both of these categories have important internal distinctions. Um, and are, are, are overlapping to a sense in their logics and their purpose and their actions such that this kind this particular dyad is no longer quite as helpful as it used to be. Um, so there's plenty of research on that, including the expansion of state capital outside of majority ownership, um, the role of political connections between private firms that appear to be non-state and the state, and the role of those, those private firms. I'm thinking of you know, actors like you know, Huawei, Hikvision, um, even Alibaba, others, in doing the bidding of the state, both in a strategic sense, but also um, doing things domestically, such as engaging with China's anti-poverty campaign and so forth. So if you just think of some examples of that, Huawei and ZTE are interesting examples. And you know, one way to, in fact, think about the massive amount of conflict in the West over what to do with those firms is a debate about whether they're state or private firms, which seems familiar to us, but we haven't quite captured that, I think, in the comparative politics or international political economy literature. CFC is kind of the flip example, a, pri a nominally private company um, that made a lot of investments in Eastern Europe and sort of pretended to be part of the Belt and Road and affiliated with the Chinese state, but was actually a deeply indebted kind of crony firm um, whose founder is now, the tycoon is now in jail, um, and in fact ended up engaging with Eastern European countries in a way that subverted um, Beijing's interests, but more on that um, a little bit later. Um, so here you see um, a, a certain typology that I've developed and that, that I think helps us think about Chinese capital in a way that moves beyond ownership 
And critically, um, I mean for this to describe capital at the transactional level. So I wouldn't say, I think that the challenge for us as researchers is that there's no bright line. You can't say some firms are crony, some firms are competitive, some firms are doing the tactical bidding of the Chinese state. So it's no longer really appropriate to talk about state versus private capital from China. We have to think about the logic of its pursuit. So here I have three different categories. Tactical is, is, is seeking to accumulate political prestige for managers or political power for the Chinese state. Those two things sometimes are intention. Um, competitive capital is looking for capital accumulation and tends to follow the same logic as we think of foreign direct investment in general in the international business literature, meaning pursuing markets or greater efficiency. And crony capital, which is this um, category that I think is certainly not unique to China, but unique in some ways to authoritarian regimes, is seeking refuge from the state and personal wealth and security through asset expatriation. And there are different firms that might be exemplary senders of those types of capital, but I would argue that firms overlap in the kinds of investments they're making. We can think of certain things that Alibaba has done that are both competitive, that are tactical and crony at different times, and the same for state-owned companies. And so looking at it at the level of managing the investments rather than managing the firms helps explain why it's a difficult thing for Beijing to figure out which kinds of firms to embolden and which ones not to. If it were that simple, they would have figured it out. And it's difficult for host governments because they can't figure out at any given time what firm is a representative of what type of capital. And so seeing it in this way is kind of messy from a research approach because it doesn't enable us to divide our data sets by ownership in a convenient way, but it captures more of the conflict that we see actually practiced in the world. So I'm going to skip tactical capital a little bit um, because I think the vast majority of what we read um, about Chinese internationalization looks at SOEs and looks at the political values of the, of the Chinese party state and how they're achieved in its internationalization. And less attention is given to competitive and crony uh, um, logics as capital goes abroad. So I'm going to focus on those while I talk about China's outward direct investments in general. So I've been, um, I've been collecting two sources of quantitative data, which I'm just going to show descriptively in this talk um, over the last several years. So one is a database that examines all of China's outward mergers and acquisitions from 2000 to 2018. Um, it's an interesting source of data because you have to have reporting on both sides. And so you get kind of more accurate data on the transactional level than you might from aggregate country to country totals. And another is corporate Chinese corporate filings, which I'll, I'll show in just a minute. Um, so let me just say first, um, so this is a kind of brief picture of some of what Alibaba did. And it, it, so it invested about 7 billion um, US dollars in mergers and acquisitions from 2000 to 2018. And here is the kind of brief distribution of some of that and, and in terms of some of the companies they acquired. And you can see it's divided pretty clearly between the pursuit of markets and efficiency. So efficiency in, its, in many of its investments in the United States and in other developed countries where it's pursuing acquiring complementary technology to that which it has itself for its e-commerce or mobile payments business. And then its movement into the developing world, right, is certainly not about resource extraction and certainly not focused in places where, um, where institutional environments are unclear, but rather in places where it's expanding its market access. So Thailand, India, et cetera, um, where it can basically pursue mobile payments or e-commerce in places using the playbook it developed in China. But of course, not all of its investments can be categorized as competitive. And so you see it also by, bought the South China Morning Post. I would think of that as a, a sort of partly tactical thing that was certainly enabled them to ingratiate themselves um, with Beijing. Perhaps not enough. <laughs> um, Alibaba has not, has not sort of ingratiated itself quite enough, I guess, with the policymakers in Beijing. But I, I would have a different explanation for that recent drama between the state and Jack Ma. And so this, this is kind of a picture of a pattern of investments from a commercially oriented firm that would be very legible to, to scholars of foreign direct investments from other places and at other times. But it's not just these large, um, large kind of firms, it's also the small and medium enterprises. And so one thing that's really surprising is the role of private or non-state firms um, investing abroad in the last 10 years. And so, in fact, um, the stock, China's outward direct investment stock, has steadily come down from 86% to be state-owned to, uh, to less than half now is state-owned. And that's because of the wide entry of firms of all kinds who are not affiliated with the state, or at least not majority owned by the state, including um, one-off investments by small and medium enterprises. So here you have a quote um, from, uh, from a firm that's investing in Myanmar. And the critical thing is that he talks about his capital constraints, right? This money took me two decades to earn in China and I can't throw it away. 
capital constraints being something that is not or not faced right by state owned firms and really not by crony firms, at least for a long period of time also. And so this idea that all you know Chinese capital is long term thinking and kind of undisciplined, I think is 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 incorrect, especially when you look at some of these firms who are operating in extreme hard budget constraint environments and we can think of their investments as as heavily exclusively commercial. But the category I'm most interested in recently is the crony, <laughs> crony capital. Um, and as I said, it's a logic somewhat unique to authoritarian regimes, right, where almost by definition, capitalists um, are vulnerable to the power of the state, where property rights are insecure. Um, but it's certainly not unique to China. And so I'm working on this book on China and authoritarian Asia, where I look also at Suharto's Indonesia or Malaysia, and you see behaviors that are similar from large firms there that also see themselves as vulnerable. And the key things to think about in terms of how capitalists behave in authoritarian regimes is that they do have access to some resources from the state, but frequently that access is privileged and even illicit, right? So in a place, especially like China, where you know the private sector is excluded from the financial system in, in systematic ways, that we find that you know private firms, then non-state firms, rely on illicit relationships and formal relationships, which are almost by definition corrupt and illegal and secret, right? And that secrecy makes them vulnerable to the power of the state were it to be exercised against them, which frequently it, it is, this kind of pattern of accommodation and reprisal from the state um, in how it deals with capitalists domestically has affected how they think of internationalization. In that they have short time horizons, I would argue. So many capitalists in China are not necessarily thinking in terms of how do I build a functional business with a guaranteed revenue stream for the next 20 or 30 years, but rather they're thinking in a three to five year time horizon because in their lived experience, um, that is the appropriate time frame to think about the space of maneuverability they have vis-a-vis -vis the state. So let's remember that China is a place where it was founded, um, founded as a communist regime, where capitalists suffered both at the beginning of that, um, that, that state building period, mobilization in the 1960s, and now we're entering a kind of different period where capitalists feel deeply insecure. But those short time horizons incentivize certain kinds of behaviors that I think is, is, presents a unique challenge to how we've thought about um, international political economy before. So let me show a couple of examples of what I mean by that. And so I'm going to just show two, um, just so kind of maps of the outward investments um, in the firm structure of two um, companies that have come under fire from Beijing um, in the past five, uh, I guess, yeah, five or six years, really since 2016, 2017, for their outward direct investment. And these two firms are affiliated with one another. So I'm going to talk about Ambang and then Fosun. Um, as they're, they've been designated as what's called gray rhinos um, by Xi Jinping, which is a description about a kind of a, a risk that is a systemic risk that is, is hard to see unless it starts moving very fast. So on buying insurance, um, which I said I've been doing this research also on corporate filings, um, and so trying to figure out using um, the, the state's database on corporate filings and declarations, how large are these firms actually, which is a difficult thing to do because they are quite obfuscated um, purposefully, and a lot of their shareholding is really hidden in these pyramidal structures. But we found that they have 92, they, Anbang at its height had 92 directly owned firms and 1,257 indirectly held firms. So kind of um, layers upon layers of firms that's, that are controlled but are not necessarily in their corporate map. And you can see the investments that they're making follow much more of this crony logic of asset expatriation, right? Investing in all kinds of real estate, entertainment, right? In places where you know, it's not weak institutional environments, it's strong institutional environments, right, where they're safe, right, from the, the power of the Chinese state. Um, I put a question mark up to the amount in Belgium because not all of mergers and acquisitions have to declare but below a certain threshold. They don't have to declare the terms of the deal. So it's not always possible to know exactly, right, what the size of the global footprint of firms like this are. Um, but in any case, this is a kind of basic picture of, the, of some of the important investments they made. Um, they, so I told you Alibaba made about 7 billion um, of mergers and acquisitions from 2000 to 2018. So for all of these firms combined, the four gray rhinos, I'm only going to show you two, um, it exceeds 50 billion. <laughs> so an, or, you know, an order of magnitude almost more than China's most flagship competitive firm. And so these, these, these firms were really motivated to get their money out of China, or as, as one person put to me, turn my renminbi into euros as fast as possible, especially in the context of Xi Jinping's anti-corruption campaign. Campaign. So this is Fosun, which is um, has about six, we found so far 623 um, firms and uh, that are directly controlled and 750 kind of obfuscated firms that they nonetheless invest in and, 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 and appear to partially control. 
And their pattern of investment, this is a, a technology and diversified conglomerate holding firm, have been very similar. So Ambang was nationalized by the Chinese state because of its excessive debt and financial fraud. Um, in 2018, Fu Sun's um, chairman was detained several times, but released several times. Um, but it was very clear starting in spring 2017 that the company was being compelled to unwind many of its international investments. Again, most of these being in secure companies in places where they thought their assets um, did not face a lot of threat. So, uh, so the lower risk, basically, the better is the logic of that kind of capital. So what does this tell us? Why are they behaving in this way? So I've argued that, cap, that, that the way that the Chinese state approaches internationalization is not necessarily through strategic plans and blueprints, but rather through campaigns. Campaigns, as I said, are a familiar mode of politics in China domestically. It's how China carried out many of its um, political objectives, including the one-child policy, anti-corruption, um, the Great Leap Forward, all examples of campaigns. They're nothing new to Chinese people or Chinese firms. They involve mobilization from the top down. They involve propaganda. And a typical life cycle involves a, a kind of period of over-enthusiasm and then a period of, of adjustment. Um, so the, the famous phrase from Lieberthal and Oxenberg is, you know, getting along to get ahead. So figuring out, right, how to interpret the information coming from Beijing and how to appear to align your interests with those of the state, even though you're pursuing your own interests. And it's worth mentioning that this campaign style governance is very unfamiliar to Western countries and host governments who, when Xi Jinping says we're, you know, we're investing a trillion abroad in the Belt and Road for win-win development, can't interpret what that means, or in Made in China 2025, which is also a campaign to say we're pushing towards self-reliance and domestication of supply chains, can't understand the mobilization and the propaganda that go along with that and perceive it, correctly or not, as a threat. So let me just first talk about this one risk to how we think about campaigns and outward and China's outward investment. And then I'll talk about um, a campaign which many of us are very familiar with, um, which is the Belt and Road. So first is that there's political risk for the Chinese party state in these conflicting goals of crony competitive and tactical capital. And that political risk is really it's domestic political risk. So when there's a domestic campaign to say invest outward, what happens is domestic banks here, I should finance outward direct investment. Firms here, I it now is the moment, I have the kind of political green light to go out and invest, right? And then you find what the state wants to do, right, is kind of restrain the crony, enable the competitive, and discipline, deploy, but also discipline the tactical capital. So, you know, make sure that, you know, they're achieving China's interests, but then discipline them as they're doing it. And the campaign kind of makes these goals in tension. So, on the one hand, you have this push to go outward, and companies like HNA will do that, right? Hainan, Hainan Airlines, which recently declared bankruptcy, they will make large scale purchases because it's an opportunity for them, especially in the middle of the anti corruption campaign where they don't know how long their time horizon should be <laughs> at that point and how long their access is going to be possible um, to invest abroad, right? When they do so, they, they basically borrow from domestic banks and generate economic risks, which are political risks for the state. The other example I give here is that of Luck and Coffee, um, which many people have been very um, attentive to, which is a company that listed on the New York Stock Exchange, but was essentially, a, a, you know, founded on a, a, on economic fraud, um, and they basically defrauded investors in the United States. And that logic is also about how do we get as much advantage of, how do we kind of reap the advantages of the access we have in the short term, and that kind of cast out on all Chinese IPOs in the U.S. Right, and the feeling is now um, there's a lot of energy in Washington D.C around the Chinese stock market is filled with fraud. <laughs> Chinese companies are, many of them are fraud, are fraudulent, and we should decouple financially from China, which is another political risk for Beijing. And then the tactical capital, right, also overshadows the commercial motives. And this is something that um, I've been very interested in, in the context of Made in China and in Belt and Road, right, which is the more that the Chinese state pushes kind of the tactical um, logic and it pushes it via these campaigns that have mobilization and that have um, high propaganda, the more that commercial logics get endangered and overshadowed. So ZTE, this company that very much depended on US markets, right, in order to grow, um, and US technology was kind of doing tactical things on, on the part of Beijing and Iran and North Korea and then lost us access to US markets. And so that those tactical and commercial motives can be in tension in problematic ways. 
And then the whole idea of Made in China 2025, I can't tell you how many terms, how many um, firms I've talked to both in China and outside of China that are affiliated with China who say, we hate this. The more they say Made in China 2025 and self-reliance, the harder it is for me to make investments, the harder it is for me to acquire the companies I need. And I have nothing to do with the state, right? So we can see these different logics in the state's management of them in the particular context of how politics work in China as, um, as filled with contradictions and generative of political risk. So let me talk about experimentalism and let me talk about the Belt and Road very briefly. Um, so it's important. So what is the Belt and Road? Um, so the Belt and Road is, is, is many things, and but the things that it's not is an official policy with a blueprint. So when it was conceived in 2013, the Belt and Road had no official map no centralized control. So there is a small group within the NDRC, but that small group sort of sets the overall idea of what the Belt and Road is and did not have any policy or did not have any power to review specific investments, plan specific investments or conduct the lending themselves, right? The lending is was up to the discretion of Chinese policy banks um, and others um, who are doing the financing of these kinds of activities. It's also 2013 was not the beginning of China's outward foreign direct investment and many of the most kind of um, the investments that we most associate with the Belt and Road were actually completed well before Xi Jinping was a name that was known to most Westerners. And there is critically no formal data on the Belt and Road and partly there's no formal data because there's no formal process through which projects are or are not affiliated with the Belt and Road. That's starting to change and I'll say some things about that. And so what the Belt and Road is, classically, is a campaign. It has mobilization, it has propaganda, it has a typical life cycle involving overenthusiasm, which in this case involved massive external lending um, without necessarily any command um, or centralized command or um, you know, risk assessment procedures. And it's undergoing tweaking and change over time. So let me say a few things about um, an example which um, I know very well, which is China's work in Sri Lanka and China's investments in Sri Lanka. And um, Deborah and I have, a, have an essay about this in the Atlantic. And so this won't come as a surprise to her because we spent many hours <laughs> talking about Sri Lanka. And much of this research is available as an um, HBS case study, um, which is published, which is very detailed. So I got to go to Sri Lanka and look at the documents and talk to the negotiators. So the story we get, right, which is very consonant with this China Inc., you know, China as a strategic planner, how China got Sri Lanka to cough up a port. I love the New York Times. I subscribe. This headline got it wrong. So what happened in Sri Lanka is that there were two phases of development of this port, um, a port which had long been a dream of the Sri Lankans for a variety of strategic and economic and commercial reasons and was the subject of two feasibility reports, one conducted, conducted by a Canadian company and the other um, conducted by a Danish company, both of which found the project to be feasible. The first phase came while Sri Lanka was still at the high point of its domestic civil war, which had been ongoing for 30 years at that point. Um, and so it was very difficult for Sri Lanka to get capital for that kind of project. Um, and it was a niche non-container cargo port. So, the port in um, Hambantota, it's about 10 nautical miles from the Indian Ocean shipping lanes. You can see the ships there if you stand um, at the port and look. Um, and so the idea was to create a niche port that did non-container cargo, so roll on, roll off, bunkering, storing, shipping services. And instead of you know thinking of it as a debt trap, so let me just show you this first. So the interest rate that Sri Lanka was given for phase one um, was 6.3, and this was basically global lending rates at that moment. Um, and then the second phase was 2%, and you can see where global rates were at that point as well. And so this idea that they trapped them with these unreasonably high interest rates is kind of hard to bear out when you look at the basic data. The prices were globally competitive, and so what happens with phase one is that they make this investment and the president of Sri Lanka at the time, whose brother is now the president, um, Mahinda Rajapaksa, who's from that region, um, kind of pushed um, the China Exim Bank and China Harbor Group to accelerate their investment in phase two while he was still president because he promised to deliver this port to the place where he was from, to his home district and bring big ships there. And so they kind of accelerate their investment in, in phase two at the urging of the Sri Lankans rather than at the urging of um, the Chinese. And both, right, are involved China XM Bank and China Harbor Group, but that's not the end of it. So while, you know, observers of what China is doing in the world are very attentive to infrastructure because it's, you know, sexy, possibly militarizable, all these things, and nobody's very much interested in real estate, real estate is quite important. So here on the left, you have a picture of the port, the port in Hembantota. You'll notice the absence of ships. 
And on the right, um, you have a picture of what's called the Port City development um, in Colombo. So right next to the Port of Colombo, it's called Port City, but it's not a port itself. It's a massive real estate investment. And at this point, you know, Colombo real estate prices are skyrocketing. There's infinite demand um, and, and, and land is running out. And so what they do is this massive 1.4 billion foreign direct investment, which also starts um, around 2010, 2011, 2012 um, in land reclamation to generate more real estate in Colombo. And they stand to make basically 10x on what they invested, even if they get none of the legal stabilization that would make it a super high-end development. So what we end up getting, this is a, a picture of the super high-end, you know, every, every Chinese development has to have a model. So this is the model, some of my students looking at it in January of last year. So what we get here, and the New York Times made a big deal of the, the payment you know, from China Harbor Group, which again is both the investor in this real estate project and the, the, the partner, the contractor for developing the port in Hemantota, in, in sending money to Rajapaksa's campaign as if that's evidence that China had strategic interest in the port. But in fact, both of these projects were held up um, in the election that happened um, that kicked Russia Paksa out of office, which itself was very surprising. So this idea that China knew ahead of time that somehow there would be a, a, an election that was narrowly won by someone and then used that to extract the support that it wanted is especially absurd. So it was a very surprising election. Sirasena was, was one of Rajapaksa's own ministers who defected. He won narrowly. I think Sirasena himself was surprised. He ran on the renegotiating the debt. He suspended both projects, um, which were held in the balance as they renegotiate the terms of the port. So initially, the Sri Lankans approached the Chinese to say, we, we need to renegotiate this based on their debt burden, which was really overloaded under international sovereign bonds, which were, you know, had a much higher yield and were much, you know, shorter and in, 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 in maturity, right, than the Chinese port, um, the Chinese loans for from XM Bank for the port in Hematoda. So in fact, they get the initial offer for 80% equity, they negotiated it up to 85% equity because their interest, the Sri Lankans, was to get as much possible equity investment from the Chinese in the port so that they didn't have to deal with commercializing it, which ironically is exactly what both of the feasibility studies really recommended that you get an international operator for the port, which is what they end up having in China merchants um, in, um, in Hambantota. So the Sri Lanka story, I know that that's a lot of details. I think it's important to get it right, though, because we have this narrative that China somehow seized the asset or that there was a, you know, um, a, a default, and none of those things are true. And it's a pattern, this pattern of commercial investments alongside infrastructure investments that, that, that obtains elsewhere in Southeast Asia, where also Chinese, um, Chinese investments have been politicized. So Malaysia is very familiar to a lot of people. It's a very similar trajectory, a surprising election win, these kinds of Chinese projects that are held up as a result of that and renegotiated. And Myanmar as well, right? So in Myanmar, um, where I was also last January with students, there's a huge um, 7.9 billion. And again, it's foreign direct investment here with a JV in three phases, um, a huge port development in the Northwest of the country and a massive real estate development in downtown Yangon, which has just pure commercial interests. Um, and so seeing both of these as kind of tactical and commercial, but tied up together is I think the appropriate way to see it. The interesting thing, if I could just pause here about Myanmar, is that um, the, the, the person in charge of the project on behalf of CITIC in Myanmar says, you know, we looked at what happened in Sri Lanka and we realized that if you, you know, if it's debt, then it becomes, um, it becomes difficult and it becomes, you know, politicized. It has to be foreign direct investment. And we do it through phases because we understand now that the elections make it difficult and elections can be focal points for this conflict. And so we're better learning how to structure some of our investments to deal with this political risk. So the, the BRI is being adjusted as most campaigns are over time, being recalibrated, the meaning of which is still, um, is still kind of um, being understood and de debated in Beijing. There's a new national agency for international development and cooperation, the Guoha Shu, which now approves every outward investment to make sure that they are in line with Beijing's strategic interests. The, China, the, the Central Commission on Discipline Inspection is also being sent abroad um, to monitor, in the, quote, in, in the words of the CCDI, to make sure that no, uh, the, no assets of the Chinese state are being you know, spirited abroad. And Made in China 2025 is basically all there, just as another example, in its actual policy pieces, but many of the campaign aspects, so the, the kind of um, self-reliance for a while were underemphasized in the context of the trade war with the United States. 
Um, but now that we know for the long term that there may be this movement towards conflict um, or, or economic conflict and economic competition between the countries, the propaganda is being amped back up to emphasize the self-reliance. And those campaign adjustments are combined with regulatory adjustments. So capital controls in 2016, which came on irrational investments in non-strategic sectors and domestic re-regulation, particularly in the financial sector to make sure excessive risks aren't taken on as a part of China's project of internationalization. So these limits, right, to China's outward investment, especially when we think of its strategic interests. So one, which I talked about quite extensively, is the political risk and the conflicting goals of crony competitive and tactical capital. Second, what China's doing is experimental rather than strategic. And that approach generates risks, right, because it's not planned in advance. It's sort of, let's see what everyone does, and then we'll adjust it over time. But that adjusting over time encompasses learning learning from the Chinese state and from Chinese firms about political risk and about how to engage with one another. And I would argue that policymakers abroad should be attentive to that learning process rather than assuming that everything was planned in advance. And lastly, let's recognize that the centrality of politics in China and the organizational features of the party state, both its organization and its style, right, which is this campaign style of doing things, it does generate global misunderstanding and global backlash and kind of limits both the tactical and competitive efforts of firms. So some conclusions, right, is that I would argue we should be especially attentive to the domestic sources of constraint for the PRC's global footprint. So China is really the first authoritarian regime to extensively internationalize both in international finance, international investment, right, in a coordinated manner or in a kind of not coordinated, but um, in a rapid manner this quickly as an authoritarian regime, right? And, and we tend to read that as it's part of central China's centralized plan. But in fact, all authoritarian regimes have vulnerabilities, right, and have domestic politics and conflict frequently between the state and business. And those things are constraining, I would argue, for how the PRC is globalizing. And that, you know, in, in keeping with that, state capitalism as a paradigm kind of overestimates and underestimates the power of the state. It overestimates the extent to which Beijing can coordinate and, and control its actors, but underestimates the ways in which all kinds of actors, including non-state ones, are appearing to do the bidding of Beijing and sometimes, in fact, doing tactical things on behalf of the party state. But as I've called it, party state capitalism, right? Which, which if you would, if, if you know, if you actually read the paper, you realize we don't mean that it's strategic and coordinated, but that its underlying goal is political stability is not so easily contained. That part of what's made China so dynamic for the last 40 years has been the innovative power of its entrepreneurs, and that the part, the, the kind of new emphasis on politics may limit some of those. Um, innovative capacities and so therefore it's not so easily contained um, nor does it is it easy in the sense that it generates backlash from trade partners which then um, puts limits on China's um, strategic abilities abroad but that we should think of discretion as the core approach so um, you know Ed Steinfeld who wrote a, wrote an interesting book 10 years ago on on China's playing our game I think we decisively know that they're not playing whatever game that is of abiding by global rules, but that's not necessarily because they have their own rules they want to impose, but it's because of the preference for discretion, which has been a core element of how the party state has dealt both domestically and internationally, really for the last 100 years since the founding of the party, that ability to, dis to, 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 to exercise discretion and adapt over time rather than commit itself to rules in advance is how it's dealt with its domestic partners as well as international ones for a long period of time. So with that, I will say thank you um, and, and eagerly hear what, um, what my colleagues have to say. Thank you so much, Meg. That was, um, that was really terrific and fascinating. Um, I have uh, two very quick uh, programming notes. The first is I realize I made a mistake when I said we have an event on India on Friday of next week. It's actually on Wednesday morning of next week. So please check the events page if you're interested in that. Um, I also uh, got a note from our staff. I just want to um, welcome members of the newly created IEP executive circle who are here um, in the audience with us today, including our co-chair, Frank Wong, who's been a long supporter of our work on China. Um, and then lastly, um, you'll notice there's a, you know, an option to put questions in the Q&A. And so we're going to have two discussants and then we'll have a moderated discussion and I will be pulling out your questions from the Q&A. So please go ahead and uh, put questions in there as they come to you. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over uh, to Deborah. Thank you, Jay. And thanks, Meg. That was 
fantastic. Uh, <laughs> you know, every time I, I hear you speak or sit down with you, there's just so many things that, that uh, make my mind just go, yes, yes, yes. And let's, let's write another public square piece about that. <laughs> so um, that was really great. Thank you for doing that. Uh, very, very stimulating. I think the this division that uh, you and, and your co-authors um, have developed about the crony capitalism, competitive and tactical capital is going to be extremely helpful. I really think this is going to be a, a signature um, framing of China's outward um, engagement. And, and I always like to say engagement because I think investment, you know, there's so many ways to see investment as FDI, um, and then as lending, and I think those things are are different. And then there are other forms as well. So um, that's that's it's just it's super super helpful. And so that um, and then what you uh, say also about the nature of Chinese outward engagement um, that it's experimental. You know, it's uh, as as you and I have talked about this. It's crossing the ocean <laughs> by. By feeling the stones, as as Washi Lai said it, the notorious Washi Lai, and then the idea of the campaigns, of course, it's just as so it makes so much sense, and that's um, you know very much based on your deep knowledge of how things have worked historically, and then that it's frequently commercial in nature. Yes, <laughs> it is, and that the state is responsive to domestic security concerns. Uh, China's uh, overwhelming concern has been for instability domestically, and so unemployment, the lack of work for um, uh, areas of overcapacity, all of these are drivers. All right, so all of those I think are, are uh, absolutely just core to our understanding of these things. And I have um, a few, I guess, comments and questions and things that, that uh, just to elaborate a little bit on what you said and then a, a few questions as well. So the first one is, um, and it, it's about the party and the role of the party because you've got the party state as one of your key categories here. And you know, we haven't really, I may have missed it, but I haven't seen that much that's really focused on the party overseas. And so, um, you know, McGregor's book about the party had, and that was 10 years ago. Um, and he had one chapter, I think, on how this affects Chinese uh, engagement outside of China. And so I think it, it's it's interesting about how do we see the party operating inside Chinese firms uh, overseas, and you know is there some distinction there between uh, the, those party directives as they come from Beijing, um, as they operate overseas, and what what do these party people do? And then um, and then I also see a distinction because you've got the provincial level, so there's all of this going on. Um, the uh, all of the actors at the provincial level are, are pushing, pushing, pushing as well. This this uh, overseas engagement, and so that's um, how those things work. And I don't know if that's interesting or, or important, but it just seems to me we don't really understand that. And the second thing that I, that I think that that I would be wanting to talk to you if we were sitting on Zoom alone is <laughs> a credit enhancement. And so this is how we know that. Um, often Chinese lending has worked inside China. And so we have all these examples of how um, the different borrowers in, inside China have used credit enhancement to get loans from China Development Bank and others. And that, uh, just to explain that, that's, if you look at a project and just on the face of it, it doesn't look as though the borrower can repay it. Um, but then there are a bunch of other things that load in, you know, there are offtakes from different things. There's real estate that comes along beside the, the, uh, the investment that they want to borrow for that is going to generate tax revenues. And then all this together becomes a lending package. And it's one way that I see um, that Chinese bankers operate overseas as well with this credit enhancement model. And so I wonder, um, real estate is a, is a really big factor there. And so the real estate, I see this happening in Djibouti, for example, that the whole lending package um, only makes sense when you have the real estate component added to it. And I see this in Laos too. So I'd love to hear what you have to say about that. But my third comment um, has to do with uh, how, and this again, this, this will show how long I've been in this field. But when I was a student, um, you know, we used to study Rostow and stages of development. And you know, we also looked at Marx. Marx and he also had stages of development. 
And a lot of what I see is that um, China actually sees uh, that planners in China, they see their future in, in terms of like their stages of development. And so they're, um, you know, the, the campaigns, all of this is happening as well. But there is also a strategic plan, but it's not something that I would see in terms of like China's going to take over the world, but China's going to be evolving in ways that other countries have evolved uh, in a broad sense before, the way Japan evolved, you know, earlier times, Korea, Taiwan, and there's an East Asian component to this that, that, that I and others have written about. But the point is that if you only look at China's outward engagement with a security lens, you don't see this. You don't see this like unfold as uh, as it's unfolded in the past. We have Chinese characteristics. <laughs> All right, so um, let's see. So the fourth or the another thing that uh, that I think it might be fun for us to talk about in more detail. But this this cronyism, you know, in Africa, uh, what what I've called this is um, in part, you know, we have uh, CEFC in Africa as well. You know, they were involved in Chad and and Uganda. Um, and then there's also this notorious guy, Sam Pa, that got a lot of airtime at one point. You know, he was involved in Angola and other parts. Um, and what I saw is that these, these guys disguise themselves as official. You know, they're always getting their pictures taken with Chinese ambassadors. They name their companies China this, that, China International Fund, China Energy and those. And so they kind of disguise themselves as being, uh, they pull this cloak over that, you know, I'm official. <laughs> And I think it's interesting. And they also play this role as the broker. So we can see this as in Africa, it's an old role that was played by, you know, there are French brokers that were involved in Angola Gate and scandals in the past. So there's that, that uh, cronyism um, example. And then um, the one last, well, two quick things. I don't know how much time I have, but two quick things that um, in Myanmar, I, I suppose you, I'm sure you already saw this, but I thought it was interesting that after the Myanmar um, investment, 7.9 billion um, was in the news, you know, the United States sent a team there to help to help Myanmar renegotiate this. And then the, the news that came out of that was that they negotiated the 7.9 billion thing down to way under 2 billion because it was all inflated <laughs> in cost. And so uh, I thought, and then of course, you know, the the people that I knew that were looking into this said, well, that was actually just the first phase. And so that was, you know, but it was really, it was not due to the Trump administrations. You know, they came in there to help Myanmar and, and got them to get this, you know, bad investment to a realistic price level. So that, I thought that was an interesting aspect of it. But my last question is, um, when you are talking, um, and I think you are, are right about this, about China does not commit to global rules, not because it has a plan, but because it prefers discretion. So I would love to hear either now or you know later when we have time to discuss this. What China did recently is they did commit to this debt relief effort under the G20. And you know that's what I'm working on right now. So I'd love to hear your thoughts about you know, why you think that one they said yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, to Deborah and Jay as well. And thank you very much, Meg. I really enjoyed reading the comparative politics paper as well as your presentation. I think uh, work like this is quite important because it delivers nuance, right? And so it's important not only from a scholarly perspective, but a policymaking perspective as well, right? Uh, in order to think about, uh, as you put it in the paper, disaggregating capital. So we understand what China's trying to do abroad. And in fact, there can be a multitude right, of different goals and incentives. And so I agree that sort of uh, emphasizing the points of experimentation, uh, you know, using both state and market channels, uh, emphasizing domestic politics. This kind of work is quite important because then it also forces our policymakers to think in a more nuanced way and get out of maybe viewing things from a grand strategy uh, and security perspective solely, right? So I think that's quite important. Uh, in terms of what I'm gonna do with my comments, I'm gonna start uh, with your classification, <laughs> use that as a departure point, um, and basically, uh, you know, try to think through uh, what some of the uh, scholarly and policy implications of those uh, of the classification is. Um, now, I guess, uh, first of all, I think it's really important work to have a classification system like this, right? Uh, because it does let us understand sort of the nuance of Chinese investment abroad. But of course, right, as scholars and academics, part of the fun thing about classification systems is 
pushing back in terms of the blurred lines, right? Uh, and so one thing, as you pointed out yourself in your presentation too, so one thing that came to mind, um, you know, as well as you were presenting is that sometimes I think in the paper and probably even more so in the paper, it's presented as the target matters, right? Um, so is the target, uh, you know, ultimately uh, states, is the target market? Uh, what is sort of China trying to accomplish? But it seems the added value of the work is the domestic politics, right? And when you when I hear you present, you put much more emphasis on the domestic politics than I think comes out in the paper, right? And so the because I think the lines can really start to get blurred, right? Even hearing you talk through the Southeast Asian cases, the lines between the tactical and the competitive blur, right? In fact, even taking on the debt trap argument necessitates blurring those lines to some extent, right? Um, where comparatively, I think there are more concrete lines in terms of the domestic process, right? How do firms internationalize? What is their route? Is it hard won capital, right, as you suggest? Is it cronyism and political alliances? Or is it kind of state guidance, right? Those are kind of three very different pathways. And from my perspective, and it comes out obviously in your work with comparative politics as well, but I think sometimes there's more emphasis on the target where the added value is really the process. So I was wondering your thoughts about those blurred lines. Do you agree, disagree with uh, blurred lines in terms of the target um, and uh, potentially thinking through that maybe as you develop it and market in the future, maybe the domestic politics can even lead on it to some extent. Um, now sort of as a departure point from those classifications, thinking through some of the scholarly implications as well as the policy implications, right? And then particularly, uh, via something that all of us care quite a lot about, right? And if you talked a lot, a lot about in your work is centralization versus decentralization, right? So there's the meme, right? There's the idea that what China's doing is very centralized, right? China Inc., right? And you're breaking down, right? That mythology. Um, but when we look at your categories, it's quite interesting to then think about, to kind of continue our nuanced learning. If we apply a principal agent problem to each of those categories, Right, where in what categories uh, is China most likely to continue to assert control? And in what categories is it likely to be more diffuse? And then maybe even counterintuitively, does something like tactical capital, when I hear you talk, even that category seems to be more diffuse than perhaps uh, China would like. So why this is important, I think from a policy implication standpoint and from a scholarly implication standpoint is then Right, this then sort of raises the question of what does the world start to look like? What does the rules of the game start to look like? Because you can imagine sort of one world, right, where uh, maybe this competitive capital from China really is enabled to emerge, right? And it's enabled to operate globally. Well, that's a world to some extent where, where you know, there's a lot of economists in the room. That's an efficient world, right? <laughs> to some extent, right? A more efficient world, a relatively more efficient world. But then we can also imagine a world, right, that's a bigger departure point from the status quo compared to that competitive world where tactical capital right, is winning out. That suggests a world of greater rigidities, greater protectionism, right? Even China encountering, because of perceptions abroad, right, greater investment restrictions. That's a very different world, a very different equilibrium we may be headed towards, right? So via the principal agent problem, if you could think through some of these categorizations and maybe talk through what the scholarly and policy implications are and where you see the world going vis-a-vis uh, -vis China and its relationship with China towards a competitive equilibrium where in a competitive equilibrium, maybe folks who once upon a time thought economic interdependence, right, may formulate or have an effect on China. Maybe as firms start to become more decentralized, maybe that viewpoint moving forward still holds some uh, resilience. Comparatively, if it's a world that we descend into greater protectionism, greater political rigidities, greater investment restrictions, that starts to be a very different world, right? So it'd be really interesting to hear you kind of use a classification to kind of think about these implications. And then a final point, um, just as scholars, one thing that's really great to do whenever, like today, we have scholars that have a really nuanced understanding of different regions, and China's role in those regions is just to share that empirically, I couldn't agree more with your uh, conclusions regarding debt trap diplomacy, right? And in fact, in Latin America, I've seen a very similar pattern, right? Where if you look at the empirics, debt trap diplomacy just does not hold, right? This idea doesn't hold.
Uh, even if you look at China and Venezuela, oftentimes one of the cases used, right, just like the Sri Lanka case as an example, well, once the commodity downturn hits, once, once Maduro enters office, right, uh, where there's a different kind of state-to-state -state relationship relative to Chavez in the past, you actually see a deleveraging of financial ties beginning as early as 2013, 2014. That's going in the exact opposite direction is debt trap diplomacy. Why? I would agree with you and Deborah as well. Uh, work that you found in results in terms of debt trap diplomacy doesn't hold in Africa and it doesn't hold in Southeast Asia. I found the same in Latin America. And in fact, I called it creditor trap, right? Because China mispriced risks and then they're forced into renegotiation posture as you were just talking about in Sri Lanka. They're in that renegotiation posture in Ecuador, Venezuela and elsewhere because they mispriced risk uh, rather than necessarily purposely strategically trying to indebt other nations, right? If you think of, you know, their strategy is state to state cooperation and development, why would they have the strategy that would completely undercut development, right? It sort of doesn't make much sense from that standpoint. Uh, but I really enjoyed your presentation. Thank you very much. And I look forward to hearing uh, your responses as well. Okay, this is amazing. What a privilege to get the two of you to talk about some of this work. Um, and um, yeah, this is great. So let me um, let me start with uh, with with Deborah, who I've learned so much from. Um, you know, even before we got to meet in person. Um, and uh, so so first of all, thank you. You know, I'm glad that the the typology seems useful, and it is messy. You know, it is inconvenient. I started collecting the M and A data with an idea that I was going to cut it in some like clear way, and then you know, and then figure out exactly you know transaction by transaction or firm by firm what was what. But it's very difficult to do that. And then I started to forgive myself as a scholar, because if it were easy to figure out what kind of investment had what kind of logic, then policymakers would not have a hard time with the Committee on Foreign, you know, Foreign Investment in the United States or with export controls. It just wouldn't be difficult. Um, and Deborah, I love the idea of talking about engagement. You know, I've used the term internationalization or investment, right? Internationalization, though, means kind of two things, both inward and outward. And so one, one really interesting thing, just as a, a point, is that, um, you know, political science doesn't really have a term for this, right? What does it mean when a country, you know, goes out into the world in this, like, in this kind of rapid way? So engagement, I think, is a, is a better way of, of doing it. Um, so let me just address a couple of the points. So first of all, on the party, um, Deborah's point about we don't know how the party operates overseas. I think that's right. And I think the party is also changing how it operates overseas. And so I've been really fascinated by the idea of sending disciplinary inspectors abroad. You know, it has profound implications. First of all, China's ex exercising extraterritorial control, right? I mean, they're not going to have a Foreign Corrupt Practices Act from China, I don't think. Um, but they're trying to exercise that discretionary control. But what does it mean, you know, for example, if you're Sri Lanka, a democracy that operates via rule of law, admirably so for decades and decades, and now you have, you know, the Chinese CCDI domestically disciplining um, businesses. And so we're beginning to learn about things like that. Um, but it's interesting because there's the sort of bugaboo of the party in the West, and then the, there's the way that the party actually works. And so Stephen mentioned um, principal agent problems, and that's a problem within the party as well. And so if we think about the party state as a dynamic and a set of problem solve, problems that are trying to be solved rather than like an organizational hierarchy that works really easily. And just to add one thing that's been really complex about that, um, and so, and there's another paper I have that, um, it was published in the Studies in Comparative International Development last fall on the, the growth of state capital outside the state sector, which is that the party's always been able to control state-owned enterprises or tried to control them through its organizational department. But now that state capital is going to non-state-owned firms, they don't have that particular means of controlling agents, which I think is introduces a new complexity into how, how, how able Beijing is to execute its vision. On this issue of real estate, so I mean, I wrote a book on real estate in China, and this is exactly what I think how it works. And this is also very Chongqing, right? So when you say, you know, why is it that state-owned enterprises in China were able to borrow so much, 2009 to 2012, to do infrastructure investments, the whole world looked at it like bridges to nowhere, you know, because we see, you know, um, or you know, ghost cities was the big thing. So we see the development of kind of exurban satellite cities and highways to them and new train stations and think well, this is waste, right? Um, this has no economic logic. 
But there's a there's a concomitant real estate investment in the financialization of real estate and land. This is what I worked on for 10 years before I started working on this other stuff. And, and I feel like it's given me insight into this because that's exactly how Chinese firms are behaving abroad. That's exactly what they're doing. And we ignore the real estate part of it at our peril because it, it makes us misunderstand what the strategic motives, what the commercial motives are and what the likely outcomes are of these things. I don't think so, you know, it's one thing in China to have ghost cities or bridges to nowhere because the party state in China, the PRC controls the price of capital, land and labor. So when you have those levers over domestic economy, it's easier to say, I'm going to liberalize, you know, um, migration like the hukou restrictions into this city. I'm going to make land cheaper or more expensive, or I'm going to facilitate borrowing to make this city a city, right? But you can't say that in Ethiopia, and you can't say it in Sri Lanka. And so I think, again, with Stephen's point about they've mispriced risk, they've misunderstood domestic politics in a lot of places. It's not that they understand it and are sophisticated and premeditated. They're pretty naive, I would say. Um, although they're learning. So I think this real estate um, stuff is really important. I'm eager to know what Deborah knows about Djibouti as well. Um, and this question about evolution um, and the kind of stages of development. So I, I think you're right, Deborah. I don't want to say that there is nothing to it, right? There, there's no you know, plan at all for what, or there's no thought or theory. There is, right, a theory. And you know, a lot of it is um, when when you think about, you know, how does it compare to Japan and Korea? And I talk about it a little bit in that comparative politics paper as two, um, you know, two non-Western countries that have had kind of large rapid pushes towards internationalization. And they followed a similar logic, right? So which is rising domestic wages, a desire for those, those, those countries, companies to stay competitive in global markets and, you know, tariff jumping. Basically, we have to find other places um, to, to gain efficiency so that we can also get access to Europe, uh, European and American markets given, you know, bad trade headwinds. And so I think a lot of what China is doing is that also export processing zones in Ethiopia and Sri Lanka are part of that, right? How do we make sure that Chinese companies stay in the game and can export to European markets at zero percent tariff? It's modified, however, through the authoritarian politics, right? So it, it's, you know, it, I think Japan and Korea, ironically, were able to do that in a much more coordinated way than Chinese firms, partly because there wasn't as much political friction between business and the state um, as there is in China. So I would say China adds to that model, but complicates this layer that is based on domestic politics. Um, the cronyism stuff about uh, CFC in Africa is wonderful. That's exactly what I think they do. It's kind of a different way of wearing the red hat, as we say in you know Chinese firms, that they disguise themselves as part of the state. And that is exactly how campaign politics work, right? So um, the term I use in the book, which is borrowed from you know a 1960s literature, is adept dissimulation, right? So Chinese actors are very clever at at, at knowing how to behave and how to how to pretend that they're push, pursuing the interests of the state. And now they're doing that to two audiences, right? Sometimes they pretend that they're not pursuing the interests of the state, and sometimes that they pretend that they are, you know, depending on how it suits them. But this idea of, you know, brokers, it's a history I don't know very well, but um, but it certainly is fascinating to me. And on the issue of the G20, which kind of goes to Stephen's question about how will this change over time? Look, I mean, um, so, you know, I, I, Deborah knows much more about the, um, the debt distress and debt relief negotiations than I do. Um, but my sense is that actually discretion is a hard thing to maintain when you have um, international, you know, sprawling international investments and counterparties of all kinds, especially in, you know, the par either partial democracies or total democracies, right? And so what you find over time, I actually wouldn't be surprised if China and Chinese firms are pushed actually to abide by more rules in their own interest to make themselves right um to make themselves kind of um safer and more legible to people right and so i mean that's actually the process so if you think about what happened in myanmar in malaysia and in sri lanka that is what happened these projects got um you know kind of politicized for a variety of reasons and open or semi-open politics you know depending on what country pushed chinese firms into being more transparent renegotiating terms and I see a lot of evidence for a push in that direction. So I don't think they want, they love committing to rules, but I think when it suits them, they will do that. And I don't know enough about, you know, I'm not as on top of the debt relief on the G20 as I, as I should be, um, but it seems like 
that that you know committing to that is probably a better way of getting their money back than not doing it and one thing we've noticed to Stephen's point about renegotiation everywhere i mean chinese loans have been subordinated to to to, to you know to loans from a bunch of other countries i mean i i'm fascinated like you know the ethiopians paid the turks back faster than they been while they renegotiated with the chinese and so i think what china is realizing is that they can be held hostage so this creditor trap thing is is appealing to me i always say how how sri lanka got china to cough up the money to buy a port is like how i would interpret it but yes um but then there's one last point about um you know steven's point about how should policymakers think about this and what is the movement in the long term you know i'm doing a lot of thinking about that and i'm not sure my thinking is refined yet and you know that's that's i guess responsible because we're in the middle of this thing and so we just don't know how it's going to play out but i do see two kind of different things one thing is what i just mentioned about how ironically chinese firms and Chinese actors are push are being pushed to be more transparent and to be and to, and to enter more commitments, right? transparent, credible commitments, in the developing world, right? Whereas the reaction of the developed world seems to be to adopt Chinese tools, right? So to become more Chinese about it, right? So um, you know, and certainly the U.S. and China are in a kind of security dilemma about technology policy and economic engagement, which is like you know, which makes a lot of sense. Um, that's not totally surprising to us as scholars. Um, but the but the interesting thing I think is that um, you know <laughs> it does seem to be that developing countries are able to ex are are right now able to extract more out of China because China needs them in certain ways, and the developed countries on the other hand are kind of I mean it it, it strikes me as interesting right so we have this um, you know the 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 Foreign Investment Modernization Act the FIRMA. Which was passed in 2018, um, which you know I did some some work some research on for something else, and the initial draft of that act had the C Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States CFIUS review every outbound foreign direct investment of every firm with with business in America to ensure that there's no security implication because they were worried about dealing with China on outbound investments. That would have turned CFIUS into the Chinese Ministry of Commerce, and so in a weird way. It's like everyone's meeting in the middle, um, partly in terms of adaptation. This is these are all like very, you know, early, early thoughts on this, but developed countries, which have been super transparent, are finding the need for more discretion and adaptability when they deal with China as a unique presentation of circumstances. Whereas, you know, China is meeting developed countries kind of halfway and in, in committing to developing countries in committing to rules. And so that strikes me as a really interesting thing. And one field of study that we're gonna have to find, right, is how China's reaction provokes different reactions in different parts of the world. So it's a new field, I think, um, in terms of, of um, international and comparative politics. But, um, but I'll stop there and just thank you both for these thought-provoking comments. Um, great, thank you. That, that was a really uh, fruitful discussion. I wanted to uh, grab one comment from the Q&A that came in that is kind of more overarching just for a quick sense, which is if, um, you, know, if you think of your three buckets of, of how to think of outward investment from China, how, one of the questions was, how would you compare this to other countries in a sense, right? Like, so is it that different to say you're gonna have these three buckets and are the amounts, you know, broadly the same or would you say chinese outward investment is very you know kind of skewed in one of these buckets relative to either other advanced large economies or other economies kind of more where china is that's a a great question from barbara stallings who i admire so much um so um so and i think it's a really productive way to think so i would say um a few things so i think crony capital um is somewhat unique to authoritarian regimes where, um, or at least places where for some reason, domestic capital is illegitimate, right? So, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that we would say is like kind of crony and corrupt that even happens from developed economies. So, you know, tax evasion and those kinds of things. Um, and so that is kind of a form of crony capital, um, but I don't think it has quite the same um, urgency that it has from the developing world. So I say it's like, you know, if you're, if you're, if Jay asked me about the buckets and the amounts, I'd say it's like a super minority of the activity that goes on in Europe and the United States, but it goes on because um, because fraud and cronyism is hard to stamp out anywhere. Um, but, you know, doing something like, you know, um, kind of preferential tax structuring and investing abroad in that way for a firm is still about revenue and profit maximization rather than about necessarily political safety. And I do think this idea of the safety of someone's 
family and personal life is a different kind of thing, right? The U.S. government may go after, you know, you, some of your revenues and taxes or, you know, the, the, the French government or something, but no one's going to, like, imprison you and hold your family hostage. And so that, that fear, I think, produces a different logic. And so that's small. But the tactical element is interesting. So I would say that, you know, there is tactical F, L, L, you know, capital from, um, from other, from Western countries, you know, which is the, the question, Western capital does have a tactical element, right? But it tends to be pretty transparent until I think recently, right? And so now there's a kind of, so for example, I've been very interested in, um, you know, the use of sanctions and some of the work, um, you know, the weaponized interdependence work being done by Abe Newman and Henry Farrell, right? And so, for example, like when, um, when Apple, you know, does certain things um, <laughs> with its app store or something, right, to accommodate U.S. government requests for sanctions in certain areas, should we think of that as tactical? I mean, it's, it's legal compliance with what the U.S. wants to do, but I think it does have that tactical element. But then, um, but then, you know, a more recent example is Clean Network. So the U.S. State Department over 2020, a really organized campaign to get foreign countries to invest in Ericsson and Samsung rather than Huawei. And that is tactical, right? Because basically countries are taking those decisions on political grounds rather than, rather than um, commercial grounds. And so this is where I would say you know, the world is changing China and China is changing the world. So people, you know, countries are now, countries and companies are changing the way that they do business and, you know, maybe adopting some of the, um, some of the techniques that China has used because they're kind of forced to in some ways to respond to what they're doing. So I can't say I've thought through that question um, very well, but it's something I've, I've, I'm, I'm interested in, in thinking about and been provoked to by the question. So I appreciate it. Great. And another question that I it wouldn't have occurred to me is um, a lot of the conversation today is between kind of the role of Chinese outward investment and kind of national governments in other places. And one of the questions was about, in particular, with the Belt and Road Initiative, um, how important are the cities that are involved or the local governments, or is it really all kind of state to state or Chinese firm to state? Uh, I think the cities are incredibly important. And so what you see, especially in a lot, I mean, the, you know, when you see 7.9 billion in FDI, right, that's going to be, that's going to be a set of SOEs and maybe even local SOEs, um, but, but headlined and managed, right, by a consortium that is, that is at the top is a centrally owned SOE. That's a lot of money. And Deborah's totally right that they didn't negotiate down anything. And also it was always, it was always investment equity rather than debt. And so the me and me's are in a very different position than the trapped people et cetera. But um, in any case, so you see kind of SOEs at the head of that, which is a or central SOEs at the head of that, which is a familiar model in China in general. Um, but the but the local SOEs are really important. So one thing we saw just in the last year is that um, a provincial SOE uh, has now become a part of the consortium that's invested in the port in Hembatoda, right? And a lot of that, and it's important for a lot of reasons. So it's important because those provincial SOEs and the municipal SOEs are going to have more ties with their own local businesses that can facilitate movement abroad. So you know, the dream in Sri Lanka is that in 20 years, Hemantota is an export processing zone with a lot of backward linkages with domestic industry, where a bunch of Chinese firms have come to do final assembly and then export from Sri Lanka. So the theory then is if you get, for example, a Fujianese, right, um, municipal or provincial SOE to be partner with that, well, they can facilitate the movement of more local businesses that can go abroad, right? So, um, so the, you know, the Chinese economy is huge and variegated. And so the idea is that they bring, that those different levels bring different kind of skill sets and things like that. And then in Myanmar, you know, it's really interesting in, in northern Myanmar, a lot of the firms that are investing in, you know, all kinds of things, real estate, um, industrialization, you know, factories, you know, mining, yes, all kinds of things in northern, um, northern Myanmar turn out to be um, uh, Yunnan uh, related as companies and SOEs. And so um, and that was always the model. So Deborah quoted Bossi Lai on, you know, crossing the river by grasping for stones. So the Belt and Road itself comes from these regional development programs in China, like Sibu Da Kaifa Open the West, which was all about facilitating the development of the West in China and then their cross-border relations. And so that kind of um, lower level is something that, you know, people have not paid attention to, again, because they see the state strategic interest as like coherent and monolithic, and it's not. And so we need a lot more information on that and a lot more data. But it's, but it's interesting, you know, thinking of the kinds of sets of investors of, China, of Chinese companies as consortia, 
that are headed sometimes by centralized SOEs, I find to be a useful way of thinking about it. But within that consortium, just like any Western consortium that invests anywhere, there's a bunch of competing interests and, um, and dynamics that play out. And so, um, so I can't say anything systematic about it, except for that, yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot about the provincial and the city type relationships that are incredibly important. Um, I think one last question, which might be a good one to wrap on and also invite Deborah or Steven to um, chime in on as well, is just a question about how much do you see this evolving in really in the last couple of years? So if you're if you're thinking that a lot of the data academics are using and things are probably 2018 or earlier, that if we think about the degree to which uh, she has been consolidating power within the party, we think about the rising tensions between the US and China um, on these issues and COVID-19 and what that has done to reshape, reshape the way people are thinking about their supply chains. How much do you see these stories shifting recently? So I will just say, I think it's very important that all research on China be period periodized in a way. Like there has to be, you have to say, and the reason why I say 2018 is that's when my data end, but it's also when the massive um, push of foreign direct investment from Chinese firms ends. So there's not as much, nearly as much in outward investment after 2018. And that's, you know, for a variety of reasons, capital controls and the US-China trade relationship, et cetera. Um, but so that periodization is really, really important um, for China all the time. And it's always changing. But I would dis I would say that the one thing I, I would caution just because China has C has centralized more power does not mean he's control he's in control of everyone and sometimes quite the opposite and so um, I would you know there's always those periods in China this one I I do think is exceptional in terms of C centralized control but I wouldn't mistake that for now every firm has fallen in line to do what Beijing wants so it's an empirical question I guess but but one that's extremely well taken yes. Uh, Stephen or Deborah? Um, I could add something to that, which is that um, what I'm seeing in the work that we're doing uh, on the Chinese uh, contractors and the construction industry is that they're very much saying that the um, it's time for and this has been happening, you know, for the past five years or so. It's not a COVID related thing, but they want to be moving more into FDI and uh, not so much reliant on the, the loans to sponsor their engagement overseas. Um, and it's been 40 years since uh, Chinese construction firms have been operating overseas. So, so that's something that's, you know, it's, it's a trend that um, we're looking at. Um, also, in terms of lending, at least in, in, um, in Africa, it peaked in 2013. And that was the year that BRI was announced. So it's kind of ironic. Now, there is an anomaly, um, and Stephen, you'll appreciate this, with Angola, which is, you know, it's, it's some of this defensive lending that you've talked about with regard to Venezuela is also happening in Angola with China Development Bank. But we really try to pull Angola out of the data because it just was so big, it creates all this noise. The other trends are peak in 2013, and then it's been flat and declining. And I expect that um, we're not going to see those 2013 peaks again. Well, similarly, you share some thoughts with regards to banking um, within Latin America, just again, to kind of give some cross comparative insights. I think similar to the way that <clears throat> Meg was emphasizing within foreign direct investment, there's experimentation and diversification. We're seeing something similar, right? And this also fits a pattern with infrastructure uh, that Deborah is talking about within Africa as well. We're seeing a pattern where, right, state to state relations and state lending within Latin America built up and became a, a, a pretty high share in some countries of the overall debt, right? So we still see countries working through that and that has policymaking implications. But at the same time, we're seeing uh, the way that capital is allocated abroad uh, the Chinese are diversifying their instruments, right? And there's a general desire to kind of increasingly use still state funds, but equity funds that are directed towards the private market instead and FDI. Why? They tend to be smaller amounts and hence mitigate the risk a bit more, right? Even more so on a project level rather than the state to state uh, level. Now, that being said, in a place like Latin America, if you look as a share of sort of overall loans and everything, it's still predominantly the past lending has been state to state, but we do have these other channels now emerging. And along with that, even from a banking perspective, historically in Latin America, CDB, right? Uh, state policy bank, right? Has done most of the lending. We're seeing the diversification to commercial banks, right? More rep offices and more business, you know, lower headline numbers, much lower but getting involved in more projects moving forward. So I, I think the themes that you've heard today 
experimentation and diversification hold true uh, across regionally, including Latin America. Great, thank you so much uh, to Meg for sharing your work, to Deborah and Stephen for uh, those terrific comments and this really interesting discussion. And thanks to uh, the audience for the questions that that you chimed in. We're past time here, so I'm gonna um, wrap things up now. I'll, I'll ask our panelists if they wanna hang around for a moment when it ends, uh, the, the feed will stay with you. Um, and otherwise, just thank everyone, encourage you to uh, swing by the IAP website where you can see continued uh, programming on topics like this one. Um, and uh, thanks to everyone for joining and we'll see you again soon, I hope.